Hi guys, thanks everyone who's here tonight for Endgame Lecture. I'm a Grandmaster Alex Shabalov, current GM in residence at the St. Louis Chess Club. And my lecture today is about how to convert an exo exchange in uh, Endgame. Uh, not very original lecture, I took materials from uh, a Russian magazine 64. I'm using all the materials from there. I uh, remember when I saw this piece a couple of years ago, it was like a really, uh, not a shocking thing, but like how you can actually be a, a grandmaster all your life, but uh, do not hear those simple things actually being put in words and, and see how, how they work. So uh, I really want, I want to share it with you tonight, okay? One simple rule that Capablanca pointed out in one of his books, basically, what is the advantage of a rook over uh, knight and bishop? And what do you think, right? I mean, it's not enough to say that rook is just going uh, files like back and forth and pieces are like for example like a bishop goes diagonal and there are as many squares I guess uh, most of the bishop like a standard bishop move covers as many squares as a typical rook move so uh, what is the advantage in the in the end game uh, of the rook over bishop for example uh, with the knight, it's kind of it's more or less clear um, because, well, knight is a short range piece. It's, uh, it operates well in uh, closed structures. It can go places where neither rook or bishop can go. Right. Uh, but rook versus bishop is a little bit different, okay? There are a lot of positions where there are simply pieces of the same power and uh, uh, like uh, it's really hard to make a uh, difference okay, between this two. So Capablanca was the first guy who actually pointed out, uh, no, yeah, overall, but not on a, uh, Rook can access the whole board, but not on a, uh, any single, uh, on, a, on a current move, on, a, on any, any current move, I, I think it's a, Pretty much, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, it's, you just said it's not gonna. Uh, I was I was gonna offer another guess for why. Okay. Yes. Uh, they they can kind of restrict the game better by blocking off. Okay. Blocking it off from going to one side of the board. Sometimes bishop can do that too. You know, just cut the diagonal where the king can go to. So. No, that's that's true. Yeah. So I mean. Bishop cannot, on, on his own, cannot really restrict the king from going wherever he wants, so, yeah. But uh, Capablanca pointed out the main advantage. And the main advantage is that the rook, at all times, can trade for the bishop and not the other way around. The rook can attack the bishop, and if it needs to, I can take it. Um, and this is why, by the way, the bishop is better than the knight in the most open positions, that uh, bishop most of the time can be traded for the knight and not the other way around, okay? If, uh, if you're playing with a bishop versus the knight, the, uh, the common method of playing it, you're keeping bishop outside of the knight's range. So if the black has knight on d5, your bishop is somewhere around the second rank, you know, d2 or e2, it's like that kind of thing. So the main advantage and, uh, is that the side with the rook can always convert to a winning pawn ending, okay, versus the other way around. It looks like a simple rule and that there's nothing to be explained, but we're going to look at the examples today that are not that simple. We'll see how pretty strong grandmaster will miss an opportunity because of not following the simple rule and so on. Okay, so let's start with the game uh, uh, Inarchiv versus Solak. Uh, 
an arc of very well-known uh, Russian grandmasters, like uh, 20, I mean, getting close to 2700 or even being there for, and then just dropping back a little bit, but that's the range, 650 to 2700 for last, I don't know, 15 years, something like that. Okay. And Dragon Solak, uh, super strong. A grandmaster, well, is it Slovenia? I would guess, but uh, not 100%, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so let's look at the game. Uh, no, interesting, uh, Chebanenko Slav, so-called, with A6. It's uh, Serbia, by the way. Serbia? Okay, yeah, Serbia. Uh, yeah, that would be my second guess, I guess. <laughs> All right, so knight e4, bishop b2, e6, knight c3. No, opening is interesting, but it's not really our concern. Uh, get into the end game with extra pawn for white, but, uh, but it's really hard to win. Opposite color bishops, and after c5, no, of course, if white doesn't want to lose, I mean, he's not going to lose this endgame. Just, uh, but, well, Inarkiev is the very ambitious player and feels like two pawns for the exchange and the strong bishop on c4 cover and all the squares should be enough for a win. And now it's actually three pawns, so definitely should be enough for a win. Uh, until it wasn't. Okay. White did something wrong. Position was, of course, winning. And black defended really well. And at some point, white simply overstepped the... this line where the, like, the, the risk was acceptable. They didn't want to draw. Okay, and what happens? They got into, found themselves into the lost time game. Bishop e4. Okay, rook b4, king e3. All right. Black to move, what would you do here? If that's your game, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. Well, rook takes bishop is a winning move, and seems like there is nothing more simple than that, right? Takes, takes, king takes. No, and with a simple play, king comes over and picks up both pawns. There's nothing white can do. So the question is. Why in the world such a strong player as a uh, Solok didn't do it? Why, like, uh, why even to consider a next move? Was he probably was thinking that if he uh, if he doesn't take on e4, it, it's still a winning position, but it would be a direct contradiction to a Capablanca rule. So why even? considering it. Okay, uh, hold on a second. Let's see how the game ended. Mm. So one more time. This time together with the finish. Yeah, white obviously should not like ever be close to losing this position, but that's what happened. Instead of rook takes e4, 2600 grandmaster takes, and I don't know, probably was thinking that this is winning, even though, frankly, I don't, I don't see what exactly he missed, because uh, e6 pawn cannot be protected, and uh, maybe he thought bishop takes e6, rook takes e5 is forced, but uh, Again, this is uh, chess is not checkers and 
you don't have to take on e6, it's enough to defend the pawn. And simple draw. King e4, and there we go. Okay, that was the uh, first one, first example. So the second one is Shapirka versus Grunfeld, uh, the game from 1925. Uh, these two guys you probably know Ernst Grunfeld better than the white player, even though chess wise, I think the Shapirka was kind of stronger. But the famous defense was named after Grandmaster Grunfeld, Ernst Grunfeld. And uh, okay, anyways, let's go quickly go to the position in question. Are we going to be on the white side? So let me switch to flipboard. Do you uh, want the notation open? Oh, no, I, I can close it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I forgot that this is resize as board. Yeah, I, I don't need it. So. No, the game itself was, uh, I don't know how fascinating it was, like uh, black pretty quickly allowed white to win an exchange for nothing, by the way. And no, for current grandmasters, that would be a straightforward conversion, but uh, well, it did not happen in this game. And for some reason, both sides were okay with a lot of exchanges and still still very surprising that uh, you know <laughs> uh no everyone knows that uh, you in the rook versus knight you don't trade the queen side pawns right you don't the only chance for black to make a draw if it, the pawns are on the one side of the board if they're on both sides of the board the knight there's nothing knight can do against the rook but let's see how easily white just trades both Pawns on a queen side is just like a ridiculous. I don't know. It's a but anyways, uh, pretty soon we do arrive. Yep, we arrive into a position, and the black doesn't even tries not to trade rooks, which is just like just shows us how confident. The <laughs> Grunfeld was that uh, white will never convert it, but okay, finally decided to trade rook e5. Here we go, and so let's go to the position that's gonna be in question to the maneuvers, maneuvers, rook c5, and knight e5. Okay. So this would be our starting position, and I would ask you, like, how, what do you think is the plan to convert this advantage, right? Okay. So let me just uh, go to this position one more time. And this time it's going to be with the moves, so... Back here, turn, turn, turn. Rook c5, knight d3, king f6, rook c7, rook c5, knight d3. Okay, here we go. So, the first thing that we see is that, uh, well, it's rook versus knight. Black has two disconnected pawns. Like, how is that even could possibly be a problem, right, to convert this? But what happens, those pawns and the knight create a barrier for the king to come in. And in order to come in, we need to trade one of the pawns. Once it's one against one, it becomes very tricky. 
okay? And there are a lot of the drone positions where it's easy to come across some fortress or something like this. Uh, but Shapirka uh, demonstrated a very, very precise way to convert this one, and uh, let's try to do it together, okay? Hi, guys. Yeah, good evening everyone who was not here at the beginning. All right, we looking at the ways to convert um, extra exchange in the ending according to Capablanca. Uh, no, okay, interesting guess. Rook takes e5, but see if it works. So rook takes e5, king takes, no, king g4, king f6. This probably would not work because of king f5, right? And that's it, f4, king f4. Actually, white has to be careful now not, like, not to lose this one. Um, okay, and if you go like e4, it's here, e5, king h6. It's no way to break through. So yes, we can always sack an exchange, but Black is not going to give you the pawn so easily. So let's play it on. It looks like a very, very simple task. Let's see if you'll be up to it. What do you think? A starting move? Uh, White was trying to get the same position with black to move. He already did. Uh, but the problem is on rook a5, we got knight c4, and then knight comes back. And, uh, triangulation is not that easy, because you go king g2, I'll go knight c4. Oh, and then you go king f2, knight e5, and king g3. Hmm. That's interesting. That actually, that may be. That sounds like an interesting way to go. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, king g2 is a great suggestion. Just triangulate with a king. Uh, just king g2, knight c4, come here, and there we go. Same position with a block to move. Problem, however, is this move. Okay, and well, we got to deal with the pawn on uh, e3, and if we go e4, knight comes back. So, what Y did, he actually really wanted this position to be on the board. And, okay, let me just go back. Yeah. So 95, and uh, Shapirka started with a move e4 already. So what's the idea? Now knight has to go, right? Knight's going away, and then we play in king g4. And when we play in king g4, 95 checks no longer possible, because then we sacrifice and take a pawn on g5. So knight f7. Oh, next move. If we go king, so we went king g4 and king g6. Uh, no knight h5 it does not work. I mean, as soon as a king gets in, I mean, black is done, right? It's a simple tuxwan check here, here, and now all white needs to do is just wait. Rook a5, for example, and that's it. Black loses material and loses everything so but king g6 okay now and here it turns out that there are if you go e5 right now well then knight h6 kicks the king out king gets to f5 and what after knight f7 white will be losing the pawn e5 uh waiting does not help because knight h6 check and comes back so this is the moment where 
y goes f4 takes takes and it, most important moment is that we have e5 check after king f6 if not for that move it could easily be a drop so king f6 no other moves like uh, knight d6 rook b6 knight h6 king e5 everything else loses but after this one uh, we go e5 king goes to e7 no, and now there is the trickiest part. So this position can only be won by Capablanca rule, which means you should not even like a, always ha should have it on the back of your mind that the winning maneuver will be sacrificing rook for the knight. There is no other way to win it. You cannot get the ki bring the king on f six without like a black car operation but if you'll do it right away uh rook b7 here takes takes no it's obvious draw right opposition so basically you need to get this position with the black to move and for this what's the next move for white So again, the task right now is that we are trying to win a position in the pawn ending. Mm, how does that help if like you're playing rook a5 and I go like, I don't know, king e8 for example. Okay, king g4, Diego absolutely correct king g4 this move creates a threat see what happens if I uh, like uh, the threat right now is rook b7 exchange king takes and then we win in the opposition by playing king h5 diagonal opposition that is a uh, very important black plate no, okay he played king d7 in the game but uh, no, there's no there's no chance to if knight moves king comes in and then check on seven king goes to f6 uh if king stays like with a knight then check doesn't matter where it goes pin next move takes and king h5 so that th this is the win now in the game this is what happened king h5 white wins okay uh Probably not a news for a lot of players, but uh, I must admit that uh, uh, I never have seen it presented in such a like simple and uh, visual ways, like the winning technique of a rook against a lighter piece. So you're always looking to liqu uh, liquidate into a pawn ending. There's simple. There are a lot of position rook versus knight. There is no other way to do it. So again, winning technique in the here is to win the opposition in the pawn ending. And that's what you have to look for. That, uh, and king g4 is the simplest way uh, to do this because after the king will take the rook on f7, we need move king h5. Okay. All right, let's keep going. So well, next game. Next game is Ryshevsky versus Smyslov and the famous uh, USA versus uh, Soviet Union radio match in 1945. Uh, a lot of people know this match as the kind of, I don't even know how to call it. It's, it's the match where the uh, Botvinnik played but his famous Botvinnik variation and uh, Slav defense for the first time ever against Denker and uh, on board one and uh, no well it's historical match and is like historical for many many reasons and this is the game from that match uh, we're gonna be looking at it from the blacks point of view mm. 
Okay. Uh, by the way, pretty modern line. E3. Yep, allowing bishop to take on c4. And now black is quietly prepared for c5. And when he finally plays c5, this pawn on b4 will give him a space advantage. So it's uh, white cannot play so, um, you know, so calm like Ryshevsky did in this game. He gets worse. c5, no, oh, pretty clear for every. Slav player that black is already looking for the advantage here. His pieces are much better and plus space advantage. Okay, F3, great idea by Ryshevsky to claim the space advantage back, but uh, Smyslov already starts uh, tactical operations and somewhere around here he wins on exchange after this beautiful tactical shot. No, okay, well, Sammy was uh, was a, always an optimist and, uh, you know, just continues to play it through. And surprising, oh yeah, sorry, it's just like, a, yeah, for some reason in, in the database, uh, that's how the game is recorded uh, with 24 at this point, which is obviously is not, uh, <laughs> was not played in the game, but uh, Queen went somewhere else uh, on e-file, I'm just not sure, but, but I'm just using the game from a chess base. If, if we forget about this Queen e4, the rest of it is, uh, Pretty fine. So, uh, must say that, uh, of course, later on in, on in his career, Smyslov was very famous for impeccable technique and everything, but not in this game. Black position is completely winning, but he allows it to become more complicated than it should have been. Yeah, for example, oh yeah, no, this defined 92. So, King f1, takes, takes, and pretty soon we're going to be coming to bishop g3, knight f4, and king takes b3. So, is that, that's it, yep, and it's black to move, okay, and I don't know, if you were playing this position with black pieces like before our lecture today, would the reaction be the same? Would you be like looking at the, I don't know. No, it doesn't really look like a draw. It is just because bishops are holding uh, all the pawns for a second, right? It's just, it's not really the, but uh, and probably just a king move, king to c5 and then some knight maneuvers uh, would do the job, okay? But it goes against Capablanca's rule. And what this Capablanca rule tells us to do here, exactly. Yeah, instead, this is not an in instinctive sack if you don't know the rule. I mean, that's absolutely correct. Uh, we'll be looking in the game like king c5 looks great like king c3 then i know 96 uh try to rem maneuver the knights like somewhere and try to win it like without any sacrifice but it just incorrect instinct the instinct should be to sacrifice and convert to the winning pawn ending and this is what smyslov does let's see uh, let's play it all over again to the same position. Rook takes e4. Pawn takes, king comes after. Ryshevsky decides to trade one of the pawns, but uh, the problem is that black has two. If g7 pawn was not on the board, well, that would be a draw. But two pawns, 
it's enough like uh, two pawns are winning one will cast uh, white of bishop and the other one will be queening so uh, no there is not much of a no i but still i, I like like the for example Ryshevsky like uh, plays king e5 a clear trap would smyslov play knight d3 you know and pick up the bishop or not no answer of course yeah not so g4 uh, no I don't know I would I would try to do oh well no g3 uh, the pawn will always be protected by you know moving it to g6 no g3 wins on the spot Ryshevsky resigned after g4 uh, didn't play king f5 so next one Mm. Oh, why, why, why he resigned? Okay. Oh, yeah, that was his Ryshevsky's last trap. Knight fork and king goes oh, to pick up, pick up the pawns. Yeah, you have yeah, to play yeah. g4, but that already might complicate the matters. And then next, no, I mean, probably still, no, it's still winning. Yeah, of course. And, uh, if you'll go g4 but i don't think smyslov like it was nothing fa i i think there was nothing fancy about this match in the uh, back in soviet union that was like considered like a, you know m matter of national pride though he would not play in id3 okay <laughs> g4 so the a lot of people would have a heart attack if he'll do okay just, all right so yeah let's keep going next one is okay no this is super famous game to uh, you, I, I think a lot of you uh know that but uh it's pretty interesting to look at it in this new context okay as a exchange sacrifice as the way to convert the advantage uh, the game itself very well known uh, is Semislav playable for, <coughs> uh, well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the opening. It's one of the most fascinating opening in chess. So whether you're 2100 or 1500, <coughs> it's a great, it's a fantastic opening. It's a, uh, if you are thinking that it might be over too, too complicated for 2100 player, no, not at all um it, it's great I, uh it i as i always saying like every player should have uh, in his repertoire one uh classical opening and one modern opening against both e4 and d4 no and of course against c4 and uh, knight f3 as well uh so sloth is one of those classical openings where the black does not yield in the center and Slav goes well with which openings? Uh, I think like uh, Langrad Dutch comes to mind. Uh, Benoni, hmm, maybe. Okay. Uh, King's Indian is not really a modern opening. Uh, like Banco, okay? For the, uh, yeah, Slav and Banco, that's a great combination you got like the best of both worlds and it depends on your mood if you're like a feel solid you go for slav if not you go for banco something like this so yeah mm -hmm. uh semi slav no no it's not masters if you think it's masters territory because there is a lot of theory uh no like any other openings it can be played by simple understanding what you're doing uh course you can go into wil wilderness of the Botvinnik variation and Moscow variation but you don't have to there are a lot of uh, quiet uh, lines quiet lines in Slav um, for example this Chebanenko Slav is, is pretty quiet when you can play it uh, literally without knowing any theory okay well anyways so Lombardi Fisher F3, knight c6, c4, e6, 
bishop e7, bishop e3, well, knight c2 is a, a little too much. Bishop e2, and according to modern views, it should be better for white. But uh, knight c2, no idea of knight c2 is pretty clear. Lombardi really thought that uh, d5 is a d5 is a threat, and why? Why am I thinking it's not a threat after bishop e2? I don't know. Maybe d5 is a threat. Huh? Okay. Anyway, so knight c2, d5. Fisher sacrifices a pawn anyway and plays queen c7. So very, very modern uh, concept. There are a lot of uh, openings currently just uh, following this concept. Uh, the most noticeable is uh, uh, Tarish. When d5, c4 is c4, e6, and knight c3 c5 became like really popular on the top grandmaster level idea is just to i don't know, take and like take again and it's like a oh of course no i'm sorry so first of course this like knight c6 and then well we can take take and uh, Queen goes somewhere, you know, and then bishop e6, development. Uh, well, I'm sure the Fisher was playing his, ga uh, his gambit for, for a win. Uh, modern Grandmaster is doing the target for, for a draw. So, nevertheless, black winning an exchange quickly. Uh, here it's for a pawn. No, pawn is not enough compensation for for an exchange here. Knight b4 takes takes. Rook d5, h4, king e6, king e3, and rook goes to c8. Uh, I've seen an analysis in the in in the books and like uh, dedicated to Fisher. I don't remember if any of the of those analysis was here. Uh, no consensus is it's like a pretty much every move that does not allow what happened in the game is a draw. Like a, like I don't know a four or a rook goes to like anywhere but e file. Uh, sorry, e file. Oops. I'm clicking on something which is not. Yeah, rookie one. And here's simple, right? The Fisher. I know if he knew Capablanca's rule, but uh, if you don't know it, uh, you might think it like that. The might be ways to win this position without sacrifice. Like go maybe h6, g5. And then a four, and then somehow like a, uh, maneuver your rook so that they will come in. Uh, but if you know the rule, you will not even waste your time on doing that. So, and Fisher didn't immediately went for liquidation. Oh, however, he had to calculate the pawn ending, but I mean, there's not much to it after a five. It's kind of very clear. A pawn will be traded for C pawn, and then everything on the king side will be fallen. No? Yeah, I'll do that right. Okay. So Fisher knew the rule, and now you do too. So next one. Load next game. Oh, here we come. Capablanca himself okay. against Sienowski. 1916. So let's see how the. No, the wrong one. Just flipboard. Why am I like.
clicking on enter or something. Okay, anyway, so let's see how Capablanca converted it himself. So pretty interesting, but not much to, yeah, you would even think that black is slightly better here. It's, that's probably the case. But uh, here we go, rook c4. Um, no, I don't know what it is. Is that arrogance or miscalculation or whatever? Yeah. Uh, Capablanca is white and David Yanoski is black. So you know, you probably know about the rivalry be between these two players, what was going on all their lives despite the presence of Valakine, but uh, well, anyways, v3 and black loses an exchange and I don't even know like what was the, maybe he thought that this is enough compensation, maybe that was his way to play for a win. Uh, I can only guess like what it's you know, clearly, that despite like great standing pieces, knight on d5 and uh, perfect pawn structure, black cannot really play it for a win. So after more exchanges, Capablanca started doing what he's supposed to do, which is create a passer on a king side where he has four against three. Oh, for an explicable reason, the Yanovsky cooperates, he just helped him out on it. I don't think on his own that would be such an easy job for Capablanca, but you know, uh, black simply with every move he helps out and just h4 yep so very very consistent with what he's doing and that was his trademark in the end game yeah see every move is just like by modern standard every black move last 10 moves is just a bad mistake just for the reason because with every move he helps white to clear the board on a king side and create a passer and it's like a no, what can you say here? It looks nice tactical move, g5 cannot be taken, but uh, once white defense against this threat, well, what it did is just to help him out. It did help him out to king g2, right. So this is a position, our starting position for this example for Capablanca converting himself and let me just go to the one that has moves after this, okay? Check. Yeah, I was supposed to start to uh, give you this position on the white side. I went one move further, but I think it's already not uh, not a secret to what white was was is supposed to do here. Okay, uh, so if you think that it, this position could be won without sacrifices, just maybe go rookie five and then get another rook on f five. Uh, kick this bishop out and then try to go for g5, bring the king over and maybe, okay, it's, I think it's doable, but you got to be super precise. You got to be super precise, you like uh, those knight forks, knight jumps are possible, the, you have to look out that b3 pawn is not never attacked and the black cannot activate uh, he, yeah, his pawns and start pushing them forward. Capablanca eliminates all of this counterplay in a simple and understandable maneuver. Rook e5 attacks the bishop, and after bishop f6, absolutely zero hesitation. It just like takes. Okay. It by now it should be pretty obvious to you like why why he did it. Uh, that eliminates black's counterplay, and now it's just uh, whether or not black will be able to stop g pawn. And there is no single indication like uh, why he possibly can do that, because uh, uh, white 
one will be helped by rook bishop and the king and the black cannot say the same thing so he picks up yet another one uh why he okay he can go to c6 because rook d6 check yeah the rook b3 so picks up one on b4 takes takes that also that that's actually great insight i mean uh if i didn't know this game would i play rook d6 in the game i'm not sure probably not i would probably try to push the g pawn as to g6 and try to bring my king over and try to win that like but well that's why they say capablanca was on game genius and uh his intuition tells him rook d6 winning and it is yeah te uh, technique is fantastic again bishop f4 bishop f4 just played so the black king cannot come over and then g1 used as a deflection obviously we cannot promote it the black king in front of it no capablanca tried i don't know no i don't think he tried he just uh, put black king as a maximum like passive position and then g6 bishop g7 king d5 so what happens right now uh the black is going to trade b pawn for a g pawn this way and the question after that would obviously be would black be able to give up the bishop for a pawn or not and the answer is not uh oh yeah okay i'm sorry yeah i'm uh, <laughs> i i, I don't want to give you an impression that this is a that this is a win and end game i think here uh, that this game is famous for for the fact that yanovsky resigned in equal position okay so king f5 and yeah king d5 and he resigned and i think it's in dvoretsky book that uh, he explains that uh, the black king should go behind the pawn and should save the day for uh, so i think after king f4 it's technically a draw yeah but i don't want to bother you with the with the lines uh this defense that king comes from behind and uh not only from behind but he should go to uh the pawn from the other side of a like if white king is on c6 black king has to be like on uh a4 or something like this there are some rules but uh, i believe instead of uh resigning here king f4 would be a draw yeah, it's a okay anyways let's keep going um no korchnoi versus serper this two very interesting personalities from the chess world uh victor on diet already uh gregory serper that comes to the united states at around the same time i did in the beginning of uh beginning of um, 90 of oh, 90s okay and it happened after uh the uzbek team absolutely uh gloriously took a silver at the olympiad in manila where uh serper was a part of that team um that uh, so he came and he was very active for for a long time and then retired early became like a day trader or whoever but still i mean a very interesting chess articles on many platforms uh, very interesting comments i'm sure he's remains a very strong player but just without any wish to play on but uh, uh when 
Serper uh, was leading that Uzbek team to a uh, silver um, at the Olympiad in 1992. He was, for a while, he was receiving a lot of invitations from the top international tournaments. And well, I think those were his uh, best years. Anyway, so let's go and was a tremendous defender. I mean, like, uh, saved so many difficult positions. And here, no, you can tell, Coach Noy is pushing. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But Bishop G4, Bishop D7. And somewhere around here. Black is forced, yeah, to take on d7. Otherwise, white king will take on g4. Eventually, like, will come over to 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 help the pawn on d7. And so that was, for some reason, it was the last moment where black could have done it. Takes takes and take on d8 and played king f5. No, and. Uh, this is the position that where we are starting with right and no th this is th the win here is easy because black bishop is just overloaded he's a he cannot defend b7 and g4 at the same time so the win should be pretty easy Okay, and it starts with move rook d4, king e5. Oh, it's an interesting moment. Would you take on? Oh, I mean, take on g4, of course. Yeah, it should be winning. Like, but uh, yeah, he did. Rook b4 was winning as well. But uh, yeah, the. Uh, Actually, I should have given it to you from uh, from this position just to uh, let's see wh what happens if black defends more stubborn like well then it's pretty clear what happens here we go here and no, okay what do you think the win is No, it's too easy. You just go on rook b6, the bishop cannot move, and then king goes to the other side. If king goes to f5, it goes to h4, and then you go to h5, then f4. Yeah, it's just like, it's not even a problem. So, serper played king e5, and then, well, rook takes g4, won it. And let's see what else left. Geller Michal Chishin. Okay, that would be, uh, we're going to be on the black side, uh, so just one second, flip board. It's more like a puzzle already than uh, real. So interesting, rook and knight, and three on three on the same, uh, on the same side, which gives this uh, defendant side like a pretty good chances, okay, to survive. So you gotta be careful and very good technique demonstrated by Michal Chishin. Okay, is it? Oh, yeah. How do you win this one? I think we can take the knight. Yep, correct. Okay. So, no, rook takes you to, <laughs> after what we did tonight, is not a complicated move, right? It, it, it's pretty obvious, but. Uh, 
did you really know that in order to win like this position it all comes to rook sacrifice and then you can't win it otherwise yep that's um that that's it that that's what you're looking for that that's the technique of converting the advantage so that it's at the core at the final moment it will be rook sacrifice and convert and conversion into winning pawn ending okay so let's see what else left yeah that's the Michal Chishin Barev okay this is a puzzle already on uh, black to move. What would you do? We're looking at the position from the black side, by the way. Yeah, so it's our move. Yep, you see how easy it is when you know. Um, it is rook g4, winning move. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's it, the pawn ending, there's nothing really to calculate. And uh, after h4 is fallen, there's no defense. Okay. Our next one is. Ron Lufe versus Zhao Xie. So it's a Women World Cup in 2012. Uh, was it the final match or not? No, it wasn't the final match. But Ron Lufe uh, went on to the final uh, match of that World Cup and where she lost. Okay. Uh, and then sh after that, she went to Pittsburgh, okay? The, uh, my city, my hometown. And when she graduated Carnegie Mellon in the accounting, she did like, you know, six year accounting degree. And now she's somewhere around Seattle, like uh, the corporate job, okay? Sec uh, final of the Women World Cup. And well, unfortunately, another one quit chess. All right, anyways, uh, we're gonna be looking on a white side. It's a pretty interesting game. Real, it's totally worth it of uh, the World Cup, okay? Winning, winning. So no hesitation, the uh, exchange in bishops, not, white is not trying to win it with all the pieces on the board, exchange in bishops. And then we already know how this won, right? We're improving our king to, towards like uh, the maximum and we're looking uh, into liquidation into a pawn ending. So f4, king f2. All right, and all right, white to move. Now you know everything. How do you win this? is seven king is six yeah rook takes takes and are you sure you win in the opposition
No, okay. Let's see what happens if we do it like a kind of straightforward. Rook c7. Okay. Uh, King e7. So we take, takes. Uh, King d5. So we, technically we won the opposition. The problem is it's not really helps us because black restores it right here, right? And if we can get the same position with white to move, yeah, we would be winning. But uh, it's so it's a little little bit trickier than that, but uh, not by much. Okay. So let's see. Again, when you know what you're looking for, it's fairly easy. King d5 first. King f6. And now? Now rook takes, yeah. So not directly, but king d5 first, and only after knight f6 we take. See? So it comes to a simple end game, and black resigned because opposition is one. King f8, king e6, and uh, king here, king e8. And you know, the rest is a pretty trivial. Okay. So this is this is how the conversion works and uh, even a, in the end game as simple as this one but no rush when you're doing it the, the rule number one no rush so rook c7 and tech will be a draw but king d5 and sacrifice on f6 wins so you always have to like recheck it twice because once you sacrifice the rook and it's there is no coming back there's i mean you should be like 100 percent and I think the next one will be the last example. No, it's still not. Okay, well, let's skip it, this one then. Let's go to the next. Yep, because in several Lomanishvili and load previous game. No load next game uh, this is also example from the Dresden Olympiad uh, top women uh, Russia versus Georgia black sacrifice in exchange and <laughs> compensation is overwhelming but uh, for some reason It was overwhelming, yeah, not anymore. So takes, takes. It's pretty good technique why demonstrated in this game. So again, we're gonna come to a, a position in question. So King G7. No, for those who defend in this position for like a, a the King G7 already a step in the wrong direction. If black would understand what he's doing, he would play D3 and just like extend diagonal for the bishop. And forget, this pawn on D4 will be lost. But just play D3, King G7, and I think it's just a draw, okay? Well, black was trying to, to defend it with, and then after, yeah, and this is already lost, so g5. So how do you win it? No, okay, well, since we, know, we all know like what we're talking about, it's king e4 here, right? And again, no hesitation. Uh, if this if the black pawn was not on d4 and uh, black had a bishop who could go along the diagonal back and forth there's nothing white can do there's no physical way that the king can go to f7 too. but this is just an easy win right because white won 
a distant opposition and you know, now you just got, got to be careful so this is the simplest one right the opposition and when already like here 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 and just come picking up the pawn now because the pawn is on the sixth rank it just really doesn't matter where the kings are so no of course no rush from here but white won an opposition and uh, like it's the winning one okay uh well apparently it was not the last one there was one more so i'm sorry just like let's do it Goryachkina Arabidze. Okay. Yeah, it's a World uh, Juniors 2013. Now Goryachkina is a clear candidate to be a next women world champion. Uh, no, Arabidze is uh, one of those super strong Georgian women. And they played at the World Juniors. Okay, exchange, so looks like a pretty good compensation. Uh, I'm sure it, it was a compensation. It looked overwhelming for black, and maybe it was black who was playing for a win here. But Gayach can grab the initiative, and somewhere around here, she forced the Tuxwang and won the F point. So, how was it? I don't, oh yeah, somewhere around here, right, black has no moves, so it took fine. King cannot move, I'll play h7, bishop cannot move, lose the pawn, so black is forced to trade this one for that one. Now in the same situation as before, like, uh, how do you win this one, right? King f5, here, bishop d5. Yep, and uh, this one is a little bit f fancier because we need to calculate, but unfortunately uh, we don't have that much time. And uh, so I'll just show you like the end of this game, like how it ended. So Tsuk Twang takes and come into this position and she took. I don't remember, it was a mistake or I think it was a mistake. But uh, okay, King G4, King of three. Yeah, this is an interesting moment. So King D5, here we go. Yeah, no, that, that just lost. So, how was it? Here we go, tune, tune, tune. Oh yeah, okay. Here the black made it. So, okay, yeah, now I remember, I, I forgot what it was. So, uh, taking on e4 was, uh, was a mistake here. She just miscalculated the pawn ending. She had to wait a little bit. There was a nice win, but uh, I forgot what it was. I think it started with something rook b3, some kind of a tux fine. And uh, she miscalculated the pawn ending, but at this point, black did something out of this world. Like, how bad? It's like, uh, black played king d5, probably completely forgot about this move. That's my guess. That's what happened. So instead, uh, should have just done this, right? No, it's, it's lost. C6 takes, takes, then this pawn comes with... Uh, hmm. How is it? How is it like a... Where should be a king when c6 is played? Uh, hmm. 
Oh. Ten, ten. Yeah, king should be on d4, right? So that's here, and instead of king c4, right, this one, king d4. And that should be a draw, right? So takes, no, takes is an easy draw. So c6 takes, takes, here we go. Right, this is a draw. We'll, we'll just come in. So instead, black. That was correct, and here she made like a double question mark, but played king c4. So instead, king d4, that's what uh, Garyachkina miscalculated when she uh, sacrificed the rook, and position was a draw. No, instead, the Georgian girl played the king c4, no, and after c6 takes, and this one, a pawn was. So this is like a key moment where you can. Uh, make a mistake. I, yeah, I don't want to bother you with like a, a how on a Tsuk Tsuang white wins this. And uh, I mean, sacrifices on e4 a much better version of it. But uh, that's it. That's, uh, I hope it was helpful. Uh, Capablanca rule, just uh, when you convert an, an extra exchange in a lot of those technical end games, that's the first thing you're looking for, for possibility to sacrifice it and uh, liquidate into winning pawn ending rather than just try to win with the rook on the board because it feels better, right? Okay. Uh, that's it. That's uh, the end of uh, my lecture today. I s thank uh, to s Russian Magazine 64 that provided materials for that. Uh, there was a reason why Fisher actually was a subscriber to a lot of Russian magazines while well, he was like reading them while taking a bath and stuff. At least that's what legend, urban legend says it, tells us, you know, what's happening. Okay. And uh, thank you very much and I'll see you next time.